What do you do when someone is openly hostile and angry in your work environment? Or anywhere else for that matter. Do you want to fight? Do you want to flee? What would it be like if you could flow with it? I am going to share with you a story that will forever change your ideas of what the possibilities are. I know it did me many years ago, and in this story has had a huge impact on the trajectory of my entire life. So I'm gonna share the story. At the end, I am gonna pull out three really important attributes to be able to flow with hostility. I'm Karen Valencic. I am the best-selling author of Spiral Impact, The Power to Get It Done with Grace. This story was written by Terry Dobson many years ago. So get yourself comfortable and imagine yourself on a train. So the train clanked and rattled through the suburbs of Tokyo on a drowsy spring afternoon. Our car was comparatively empty. A few housewives with their kids in tow, a couple old folks going shopping. I sat there and gazed absently out the window at the drab houses and the dusty hedgerows. At one station, the afternoon quiet was shattered by a man who entered screaming violent, incomprehensible curses. He was big, he was drunk, and he was sturdy. He took a swing at a woman holding a baby and it spun her into the laps of an older couple sitting there. It was a miracle no one was harmed. The couple got up and scrambled to safety at the other end of the car, and as they did, the drunk kicked at the old woman's back. But he missed, which made him angry, and then he went and he grabbed the metal pole in the middle of the car, trying to wrench it out of its station. I noticed that his hands were cut and bleeding. I stood up. I was young back then, and in pretty good shape. I'd been putting a solid eight hours of Aikido training in every day for the last three years. I loved to throw and grapple, and I thought I was tough. The trouble was, my martial skill was untested in actual combat. As students of Aikido, we were not allowed to fight. Aikido, my teacher would say again and again, is the art of reconciliation. For those who have a mind to fight, they've lost their connection with the universe. We are about resolving conflict, not creating it. And I tried so hard. I felt both tough and holy. But in my heart of hearts, I longed for an opportunity where I might save the innocent by destroying the guilty. And this was it. If I didn't do something, somebody was gonna get hurt. Well, as I stood up, the drunk found an opportunity to focus his rage and he said, aha, you foreigner, you need a lesson in Japanese manners. I stood holding onto the commuter strap and looked at him with a slow look of disgust and dismissal. He would have to make the first move, so I blew him an insolent kiss. And then he gathered himself and he says, all right, you're gonna get a lesson. And one second before he could move, someone shouted, hey, hey, like you and someone else were looking for something and they found it. Hey, it had a joyous, lilting quality to it. When that happened, I spun to the left, the drunk spun to his right, and we looked down at a man, little Japanese man, sitting there all immaculate in his kimono. And he took no notice of me, but he beamed delightedly at the drunk. And he said, come here and talk with me. And the drunk kind of followed him as if on a string. But then he planted his feet in front of him and said, why should I talk to you? And spittle spattle all over the old man's face. But he took no notice of that. And still beaming, he said, what you been drinking? And the old man said, I've been drinking sake and it's none of your business. 
And the old man, still beaming, said, Oh, I love sake. Me and my wife, she's 76, you know, we pour ourselves a little glass of sake every night and we go out to our garden to see how our persimmon tree is doing. My great-grandfather planted that tree and we worry about it. We had those bad ice storms last winter, but it's doing quite well, especially if you consider the poor quality of the soil. He was still beaming. And then the drunk's face, as he tried to follow the intricacies of the old man's conversation, his face softened in his fist unclenched. And he said, I love persimmons too. And the old man said, and I bet you have a lovely wife. And the man said, no, my wife died. My wife died, I got no wife, I got no job, I got no home, I have no tools. I am so ashamed of myself. And a spasm of despair rippled through his body. As I stood there in my well-scrubbed youthful innocence, my make this world safe for democracy, righteousness, I suddenly felt dirtier than he. The old man said, oh, wow, that is a difficult predicament indeed. Come here, sit down and tell me about it. The train arrived at my stop. And as I exited the train, I took one last look and I saw the old man sitting there with the drunk sprawled out next to him, the drunk's head in the old man's lap. And as he stroked the filthy matted hair, the old man said, my, my, that is a difficult predicament indeed. As the train pulled away, I sat down on a bench what I had wanted to do with muscle was accomplished with kind words. I had just seen Aikido tried in combat and the essence of it was love. I knew I would have to practice with an entirely different spirit and it would be a long time before I could speak to the resolution of conflict. Again, that's by Terry Dobson. Powerful story, has stayed with me my whole life. So I, I was so inspired by that story. I wanted to be like the old man and I wanted to practice Aikido. So now I can tell you that I've been practicing Aikido and teaching for 33 years. And I've also teach people how to use these principles in everyday life. And my, my concepts I have in a a body of work I call spiral impact. But what I'd like to do is just bring out three attributes that the old man had that's all part of this model. So the first attribute is the old man was very centered, was very calm and very present. And that is something that we can develop over time. Now the beautiful thing about that presence is it impacts everyone around you, even if you say nothing. So that presence is what allows you to do the next thing and the next thing. The second attribute was, and I'm going to ask you if you can remember, what did the old man ask? He asked the drunk, what you been drinking? With a sense of curiosity. And that is the second attribute, is when you are in a situation where there's intensity or any type of conflict, asking open-ended questions shifts the energy. And so what happened when he asked that question, what she been drinking, it put the, the man a little bit out of his emotions and into his head because he had to think about it. And that started the change that you saw. And so whenever you ask an open-ended question, it does shift the whole situation. That started the change that you saw. And so whenever you ask an open-ended question, it does shift the whole situation. The third aspect 
that was demonstrated there was around intention. And in my work, I, I discuss a, the, third, the third attribute is intention. And I discuss a lot of different types of intention. And what the old man demonstrated was what I would call deeper purpose intention, which was in that case to be a loving human being. And he was able to extend that intention, that beaming smile, because that's who he has defined and who he is in his purpose. So I hope that you've enjoyed that story. Please comment. I'd love to hear your comments below. And if you're interested in studying more about how you can bring those principles into your life, I invite you to check out my book. And then I do live virtual sessions as well. Just go into the information below this video and let's connect. So thank you so very much. And until next time, be well.